Hello, I'm live. Welcome to Performance Check. My name is Rob and welcome to more questions. Questions, questions that need answering. Um, uh, as you can see, Lloyd is not with me today. Uh, Lloyd is in the middle of a, a show run week um, and is dead and I can relate to that. Um, the, the doing show is not be relating to being actually medically dead right we have some questions uh that we're going to answer and i'm just going to jump straight into them um for those of you who haven't watched any of these videos before i take the time to post into the absolute tabletop facebook group um where a bunch of real wiki people hang out and uh talk creative things about role-playing games uh, i post questions there um and then people I post it to ask for questions there and people post their questions there so then I can read them upon this video streaming format. So without further ado, the first question is from Taylor Jeffrey, who says, dare you, dare you to make a themed one shot for either Valentine's Day or St. Patrick's Day? Two very random choices, but there we go. I suppose because they're closest. Uh, uh, and I'm talking themed with cupids, leprechauns, the works. Can it be done and not be completely absurd? Mm. I'm going to treat this question very seriously, and I'm not going to take the bait. So for both, uh, I think you have two options. One is that you say, well, you have to go completely absurd. Um, I think cupids and leprechauns uh, by their very nature, are very absurd. It's a very strange uh, idea. However, I would say that if you wanted to take this in a completely different direction, you would take it in a almost Witcher-like directions where you see the dark origins behind the myths. Um, I would say going into uh, uh, maybe pseudo-Roman kind of mythology for the Cupids and... and uh, folk tales from Ireland, that kind of stuff, and using those as inspirations for either a Valentine's Day or a St. Patrick's Day game. Uh, I think with a bit of research, that could actually be pulled off. Um, now, off the top of my head, I don't remember. I, I think St. Valentine's was someone in... Uh, yeah, and I know it's, a, it's now popularly known, the actual truth behind the myth, and I can't remember it now. It's just fallen out of the top of my head. Essentially, he helped lovers in rome in some way but like got caught and killed for it essentially i think that's the basics anyway and i i couldn't tell you about the leprechauns perhaps we would need lloyd here for his expertise uh because obviously he knows all about myths ah see you thought i was gonna go down the island route which i have now done by stating that but um i, I that that would be the way I'd go about it if you wanted to make a genuinely earnest Valentine's or St. Patrick's Day themed one shot. I would go for the hard, cold facts uh, or dark myths behind those celebrations. Um, or the other one is that you go completely in the opposite direction and make it absolutely insane, which, you know, is it's fine. I mean, I, I, it wouldn't be my personal preference, but uh, you do your fun. There's some responses here. What do they say? Uh, totally got an idea. To reskin Tomb of Annihilation to happen on Ireland like an island nation, says Adam Bennett, rather than Schult. Uh, party is a group of religious characters sent by a church to rid island the island nation of Yuan Ti. Hmm, that's quite an interesting idea. Good luck with that then, Adam. Uh, Luke Clinton Gallagher then corrects on the spelling. Don't be that dude, man. Okay, mission apostrophe. Dear me. Adam Bennett goes on to ask a question, and he says, uh, can we make a mecha grave graveyard in far northern snowy mountainous area? I guess is what you mean. Uh, but they cannot be powered by silence, just silence? Science? I can't read today. I'm going to start that again. Sorry, Adam. Let's do the question again. Can we make a mecha graveyard in a far northern snowy mountainous area, but they cannot be powered by science, just fantasy ideas? Um, okay, uh, so I had the good fortune of playing Breath of the Wild, the Zelda game, over the summer. 
Um, and I really liked how it was essentially pseudo science that was happening in the uh, temples and challenges of that game. It all appears to be this weird kind of uh, forerunner technology spread out throughout Hyrule. Um, and, you know, it seems very scientific, but it somehow it still kind of works within the Zelda mythos. Um, so I would take inspiration from that. Uh, obviously, Horizon Zero Dawn is another one uh, where it's a bit of a mystery. I suppose that is more science, science but the fact what you've got to ask yourself is, is that one culture of science is another's magic. So um, with um, Horizon Zero Dawn, from my understanding, I've not played it, but from my understanding, it's from an era beforehand. These machines have come from where the technology is now lost. So it is basically perceived as like a new form of life, a new form of science, uh, magic rather. Um, yeah. Uh, so I would go for those. I That, that kind of vibe. Um, I see in the comments beneath that, uh, Shadow of the Colossus is also mentioned, uh, which I think is a just a phenomenal game anyway. Phenomenal bit of world building in there, uh, considering there isn't much said in Shadow of the Colossus. It's all show, don't tell. Um, and those creatures, they are creatures. There's no doubt about it that they, there, are, there is more to autonomy than uh, the Colossus says uh, than... You know, they're not just machines, they're clearly alive, you know, they clearly respond and they bleed when you attack them, and yeah, that's interesting. The thing that I like about Shadow of the Colossus is that you, and spoilers, but if you don't know about, this is a mild spoiler, I won't go into it too much, but the fact that you're playing through it and then you gradually get the uh, the feeling that, am I the bad guy? I do that quite a lot with uh, D&D games. I like having PCs j gradually become to realise that the person that they're maybe working for or running... Uh, quests for or is actually they're actually not a great person and they're not actually doing the right thing and that then leaves uh, it open for the players to respond about whether they want to keep working for them or not uh sorry a bit of a random thing from uh the mecha graveyard but uh that's the way i'd go about it anyway uh, Caius is here. Caius in the chat says, uh, for Valentine's Day, I'd run a Romeo and Juliet, a burglary come romance raid on the Capulet Wizard Mansion. That's a really fun idea. Yeah. I've often thought of the idea of maybe including some, doing some sort of uh, Shakespeare um, tabletop role-playing games or theme, theme, theme Shakespeare themed game, games, essentially, but I've never really, I don't know. I don't know if... I'm sure people would be interested, but at the same time, you. I'm sure it can be done. And in fact, I think, Kaius, didn't you do something Shakespeare-themed once? Why don't you tell us about that? Um, so that was the the graveyard, the, the, the mecha graveyard. Yeah, I would use those as inspiration, to be honest. I think uh, if it ain't broke, you know... Um, yeah, I mean, with any of this, if you're if it's not being powered by silence, uh, I said it again, silence, science, just fantasy ideas, then you are allowing yourself a lot of hand waving. So you can say, like, um, okay, think of Harbinger, okay, um, the Abtab um, product game world setting, whatever you want to call it. Um, they have Astra in that, and essentially that's what powers all the technology. So there is a sense that there is sort of technology and science behind it, but there's also an element of fantasy. There's also a sort of ambiguity to like the power and how things work. And I think for role-playing games, uh, that's pretty good. I think a lot of people, will, you know, that play these games aren't actual scientists. So they want to hand wave as much as possible, which I think is good. As long as it sounds fine and it all has some kind of logic to it, then I think it'll be good. Uh, so Marquis says, romance between PCs, should it be done? Uh, so this is an interesting topic, a very interesting topic. And my stance on the situation is, and I know I'm going to start out by giving a cop out answer, and then hopefully we'll be able to talk about it some more. Because the cop out answer is, is if, if everyone's cool with it, then yeah, sure, do it. Um, if everyone's comfortable with that, not everyone would be, though, I guess, like, um, and it also depends on the context out of the game as well. Like, is this a romance uh, between PCs 
that are also uh, a couple as players, you know, in their real lives. Um, because <laughs> uh, I've been in, I've been in a one or two games where there's sort of been like a, a chemistry that's gone beyond, um, you know, what's happening in the actual game. Uh, I know some people that have met playing role playing games that are still together. For example, like I, um, so that out of game, you know, <laughs> that just happens. We're all human beings, uh, but I think in game. Like I say, one, if everyone's okay with it happening and, and you, it's not gratuitous, I think that's probably like the uh, where I draw the line. It's like, that's absolutely fine. I think the benefit of including romance within games, whether it be involving player characters or NPCs, is that um, it portrays a very human side to people. Uh, it, 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 it's something that everyone can relate to. Um, and because of that, it gives characters much more depth. This is my problem... Oh, God, do I go into this? <laughs> okay, very briefly, this is my problem with the Star Wars prequels. You know, romance, uh, everyone sort of doesn't really, you know, there's no sex happening. <laughs> Not that there was sex happening in the original trilogy, but um, there's sort of like, a, there's passion and there, there is love in there and uh, it all feels genuine and authentic and it, it, it makes you connect with the characters even more because the characters, these characters have feelings as well. Um... Whereas, you know, when when it's sort of just this thing that's generally ignored, like, throughout the world, then, yeah, it just begins to feel very cold and very stale and very kind of robotic and monk-like, you know, it's, I don't know. Uh, but whatever floats your boat. If you want, if you want to have that and that be explored, then I say all power to you. I just think, make sure everyone is on board with it um, and it should be fine. Um yeah, there's been some. I've 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 seen some great games happen where there have been sort of romance between player characters. So I, with that in mind, I could never say never do it because I know it can work, and I know it can work without people feeling weird about it. You know, um, which is important. It is very important to make sure that everyone's comfortable, but at the same time, it's good to consider how to sort of give your game an even greater depth. Kaya says, there's a lot of random dice uh, charts incorporated in RPGs. Could it work in detective games too? Oh, okay. So we'll, I will first hit the question that is I, I was just about to say, and then I can include Kaya's uh, statements on it as well. So as you have probably guessed from that, the next question is actually from Lloyd. Uh, Lloyd uh, has posted saying, um, talk about investigation-based games. Have you run any? Do you have any tips doing uh, doing so? How is it different from normal games, etc.? It's a uh, it's a tricky one. I have kind of run investigation games um, in a way. Uh, Vampire that I'm running at the moment is was kind of loosely thought up of originally for me, like it was just an idea of an investigation game. Um, but then it's become much more about uh, much more than that. It's become more of a personal kind of story for the characters. Um, but there are investigation elements in it. And I think generally speaking, when I have run investigation based sessions, at least, or, um, I'm just trying to think if I've just run a solely investigation based game. Because I like having a lot of investigation in my games, um, for the most part. Generally, when I'm running in person more than uh, online, I like to like prepare clues and and things like and props and stuff. When I'm an in in person game, like I've I've printed off newsletters and I've printed off um, uh, sort of uh, fault like criminal records and things like that for people to find and um, and emails and stuff like that. So I have done that before where I have uh, I make it feel like the players are uncovering something because they are actually given something. Them actually receiving a prop around the table is almost like a reward because there's a like a, I don't know, like you get like a folded piece of paper and then you say, and everyone is able to read this. You put that on, on the table and I can absolutely assure you without a shadow of a doubt that people will lunge for that piece of paper in anticipation of what they're going to discover within its words. Um, so that's one thing that I do. But in terms of the actual game itself, in terms of the actual uh, 
you know, playing of the game. Um, when I have run investigation themed games, um, I think I like to hammer home sort of like the the feel of it. Like uh, there are a few replies to Lloyd's uh, question. Uh, and Dawson uh, also, Nick Dawson also uh, comments on to this uh, and mentions True Detective. And I will go through his whole question in a moment, but uh, I love True Detective and True Detective has been a very big influence on me. Um, the one thing that I take away from True Detective above anything else is that the um, the setting, the world, the environment is very much its own character and personality. When you sit down to watch True Detective, uh, I'm talking about the first season, by the way, um, your you're invited into this kind of feeling of this world, you know. Um, I can't remember if it gives a specific date from when it happens, but you kind of get the feeling that it all of this isn't taking place in the modern day, uh, at least parts of it. And um, it's been a while but since I watched it, to be fair. But the, the sense of identity from the place that's being explored, I think is a real a real thing to to hammer home to players because if it's an investigation game generally speaking they're going to be doing a lot of staying put in one area sort of investigating a crime scene or investigating a corrupt corporation they're all going to be sort of in the same kind of area you know so it is your job to make sure that that area is really interesting has its own identity um and in itself gives clues to the player about what they can kind of expect you know um you uh, can't expect players to be master detectives. You can't expect one of your players to be Sherlock Holmes uh, or Poirot. So you're going to have to give them clues. And one of the best ways of giving them clues, other than straight-up clues, like I mentioned with the props, is also to give them sort of thematic and um, also all, almost kind of like trope kind of clues or cliche clues. And what I mean by that is by sort of leading them down... Um, things that they might be familiar with all right so uh say we're talking fantasy level investigation you know you can tell them how the rangers are particularly proficient at tracking you know so they can start looking for footprints and that kind of thing like fall back on the very fundamental parts of the game and and i i think it also gives an opportunity for players to look at their skill list and be able to um utilize them in ways that they haven't done before they have to be creative with how they use them um and this goes on to what dawson's question is which is i want to run a true detective meets true crime meets the town around march but running investigation games are bloody tough what tips do you offer and can investigation games be run properly in the d20 D, &D system uh and that's what i'm just, uh, about, just talking about there uh, nico is the fact that I think with the skills that you have in place already, you can allow the players to be creative in how they're used within limits, of course. Like, um, but I, I think that that's a that's a cool way of doing it and leaving it kind of keeping your investigative options open in terms of what you're rolling for means that the players can get more information. Um, I think the, the the real challenge when it comes to investigation games is having a certain amount of information, knowing that it is enough, but not too little, um, but um, not too much that it's going to be like an info dump to drop it upon them. Uh, I think keep it simple. And one of the last uh, tips that I've ever heard about writing uh, mysteries of any kind is that you start at the end and it's very very popular advice you probably heard this from elsewhere not just from me um uh but but consider you know the ending and how you got to that point rather than sort of going from you know i think that's kind of obvious to be fair um and don't forget red herrings. One of my favorite things in investigation games are being those characters where you can be absolutely over the top, skeevy, horrible, not nice, maybe even to the point of evil characters um, to lead them down a false trail. Um, and only for them to discover that they, that, you know, they haven't got the right person. Um, I think that's uh, a really good fun to do, thing to do because you can just go hand with it. You can have fun being that person and we've all watched murder mysteries okay we all know like 
you know, when there's the the obvious like person who's hanging around, it's like, oh, like you want us to think it's him, but it isn't him. That kind of character, you know. There are a lot of character uh, character archetypes that you can fall back on with investigation games. Um, I would say use those to your advantage. Don't be afraid of that because of the fact that you're delivering so much in, in, information to the players, anything familiar at all will be an ally to you. Um, and it won't feel it won't feel like that in the game. People will greet those opportunities like old friends rather than cold enemies, you know, uh, or rivals or whatever. Um, so that would be a, kind of my advice, like go for like how really how the game feels, like give you give you give yourself an atmosphere. Uh, of general foreboding or, or of uncertainty uh, everything's mysterious people are sort of holding a back information people are twitching curtains and tutting as people walk by um yeah that's uh that that would be what i'd say anyway uh, uh hopefully that was uh hope ho 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 i cannot speak today my goodness i'm gonna have a drink and i'm gonna read the next comment um Marquis says, I suggest you guys look at gumshoe systems. If for nothing else than inspiration, there are award-winning RPGs based around investigation and they do it fairly well. There are various hacks of it as well. That's interesting. So if you are looking for that, do check out those as well then. Thank you very much, Marquis. Mike Lasham says he's run one. Uh, uh, yep, yeah, it'd be great to hear thoughts on the subject. And uh, Heath, uh, one of my actors says, uh, they can be run fine in the D20. Uh, I ran one a few times in a uh, 1930s pulp setting a few years back, and you focus more on skill rolls and clues than anything. It's just to see what others think, though, and the general tips and tricks. I think, yeah, just be as broad as possible when it comes to those skill rolls, I think, and be really, really open for just out-of-the-box kind of approaches because that, I think, should be rewarded most of all. Uh, in a uh, investigation game. So I'm going to go back to the YouTube chat. Uh, ba -ba -ba -bam. So let's see. Um, right, so going back to Kaiser's question, there is a lot of random dice chance incorporated in RPGs. Could it work in detective games too? For example, in a murder case, the GM creates clues pointing towards one of three people as the murderer, but it's not actually determined which of the three it is until the players make their it's not actually determined which of the three it is until the players make their accusation. The GM gives a percentage chance depending on the thought thoroughness of the investigation, number of clues collected, and cleverness of their reasoning. Or would this random element totally undermine the presence of a detective game? Hmm. I would say I like the idea because it's like arguing why someone could be responsible for it, but I hmm, that's tricky. Because sure, there are random elements when it comes to uh, obviously with role playing games. Um, but my my instinct would be to uh, to have a plan as to who it was and stick to it and don't change it. I think that's a little bit moving the goalposts for me. Um, because then at the end of the game, you could just have like a really really persuasive person at the table who will just say yeah well i think it's this because of this and this and this and this and this and if you don't have a good enough response for that then you're like well okay then that's the person who did it um that's what i would foresee happening potentially in one of those but to be honest Caius, at the same time i really like that idea so that's interesting i think we'll have to explore that a bit more maybe because i i really like the idea of it being weirdly it makes me think of those collaborative sort of creation games like microscope uh and kingdom and things like that where you all kind of get together and you kind of reason what's what in the world i think that, that you've kind of just invented that class but for murder mysteries um and i think that genuinely could work as a game on its own as well very very cool man i like the idea of that uh, Jeff Doty says, uh, how would you even go about making a Shakespeare themed game? Uh, the stories are cool, but so much of Shakespeare is in the writing and speaking of it, it seems like it would be tough to really capture the feel. I agree, Jeff. I think the, the, the main thing that if I had to, and I'm not saying I ever will, but if I had to do a Shakespeare game, I think what I would focus on, uh, the, uh, the conflicts 
and the settings and maybe some of the characters as NPCs. Like I think the I think the ideas behind the stories of Shakespeare's, particularly the tragedies and the histories, I think the comedies, uh, as much as everyone loves to praise Shakespeare, the comedies are basically all the same. Um, so <laughs> Yeah, I would go for that kind of thing and generally get like the themes and feeling of the play rather than insisting on players speaking in Shakespearean kind of language. But if you can, then that's a that's a that's a bonus. Um, yeah, so that's that's a way I go about it. Or maybe have like a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead kind of vibe. There's a play by Tom Stoppard, a really great playwright. And it's all about Rose, what happens to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and Hamlet's supposed best friends. Uh, when they when they disappear off stage, they appear in their own play. Uh, and it's about their adventures. And I urge you to either watch it or read it. Preferably watch it. They're meant to be watched. Um, so that's that. Let me see. I'm just going to have a quick drink and I'm going to go back to... The chat. Asterix says, I love Asterix. The the goal. But I like the spelling of yours as well. Anyway, uh, I know this is unrelated, uh, but why are there no tieflings in the law keepers? They are my favorite race, and I've never gotten to ask you about this. So asterisk, um, I would hate to correct you, but there are tieflings in the law keepers. Um, there has been mention of one, uh, and I know the session where it is mentioned, there is a mention of a tiefling. There was once a tiefling lawkeeper way back in the world's history. There was also a tiefling at the very end of session two um, who was um, and is an albino tiefling. So he's kind of this white tiefling and he's got these pink eyes and he, he kind of appears really sickly and a little bit terrifying. There was this tiefling at the very end of the second session who, um, yeah, was there. And that hasn't actually, uh, he hasn't actually been back yet, but he's out there. And there was a reason why he was in the second session that no one has ever asked me about. So there you go, Asterix. There's a, there's a little nod to tieflings for you, but also something larger, I can assure you. Uh, gaming in Gotham, what a name! Welcome, Gaming in Gotham. Huge bat fan myself. Says, in regards to investigation, what would you do to differentiate basic perception versus perception investigation? Uh, arguably, they both could fulfill the same role. Oftentimes, I notice perception is just treated as being able to see everything in investigation still, skill goes and used. Well. As, as my understanding goes, perception is basically about the instinct of spotting things that seem peculiar and um, generally being, uh, it's kind of like alertness, I like to think. Perception isn't just with your eyes, it's with your ears as well, like um, or you can smell as well, like you perceive something that is going to happen to you. Uh, that's the way I look at it anyway. Um, so... Yeah, uh, that's that's basically the way that I've always thought of it. Perception is just like what you can see and hear uh, and things and being reactionary to it, whereas investigation is looking for clues, it's looking for answers. You are comparing things, you're making decisions. That's the way that I've always gone with that. Like, if I'm wrong with that, then please uh, tell me that I am, but uh, that's just the way that I differentiate between those two. Um so yeah, that's how I differentiate them. Uh, T the writer says, Shazam, tis I, your buddy T. What's up, everyone? Uh, Rob, how's it going, T? Uh, T's actually got a very exciting project uh, on the way uh, that I've uh, recorded uh, some lines for, or, uh, or a little little thing. Anyway, so just to keep an eye out for T the writer's, um, uh, on T the writer's channel. Excellent content going on over there. Um Gaming, oh no, I've already read that. Jeff Doty says, for me, perception is notice uh, broad sensory stuff, hearing a quiet sound, seeing quick movement, etc. Investigation is deep detail and taking time to study. Yes, excellent. Josh Bingham says, hi, hey man, how's it going? 
uh, to the writer says, uh, search and spot uh, seem kind of moot. I'm glad they got mushed into perception and even passive perception in certain systems, so long as the GM can disguise their dice rolls, uh, perhaps roll them at half. Um, yeah, T, I'm kind of with you there. Like, um, There's a few things that I do actually miss uh, from 3.5 and Pathfinder, but search and spot and listen are not one of them i think it's really good that they've all been put into one thing just makes it a bit cleaner doesn't it like you're either aware something's there or you're not and it keeps it broader so then a different character you know, and different races kind of all sort of function in different ways you know get the same role essentially uh Asterix says, it's T the writer. I've been a big fan for a while now, dude. Yeah, well, we, that's cool. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I was going there. Kaya says, my Macbeth... That's right, you did run a game, Macbeth. My Macbeth game had a tyrant and vulnerable until they all visited the three witches and found the three prophecies that needed to overcome. Uh, tenants of Burnham would go to the Dunisainain. I might just say that wrong. But essentially, I love the idea that they had to go find the three riches. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won? That'll be a set of sun. Where the place upon the heath there to meet with? Macbeth. Fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and the filthy air. A drum, a drum, Macbeth doth come. The weird sisters, hand in hand, posters of the sea and land, thus to go about, about, thrice a thine. Thrice again, and thrice again to make of nine peace. The charms wild up. All hail Macbeth. Thou shalt be king hereafter. <laughs> there we go. I'm sorry. <laughs> A little bit of the witches from Macbeth there, ladies and gentlemen. Um. Oh, God. I'm just looking for more questions. Okay. Uh, oh, Jeff, you're a diamond. If you are going to ask questions, hit qu put a question in front of the question. I'm going to find it easier in the chat. Jeff says, uh, most games follow a method of prep situations, uh, not solutions. Does the, maxim, does the maxim hold for investigation games? If yes, how do you prep, prep specific clues without forcing one path? Hmm. <laughs> Most games follow, yeah, I get what you mean. So uh, I think y you have no choice but to uh, prep uh, solutions in this one, uh, in the sense that you know something has happened and they have to understand how something has definitely happened. <laughs> okay, They walk into a room, there's blood everywhere, there's a dead body on the floor. That has definitely happened. That is definitely a problem, okay? And you definitely have to have a solution as to how that man got on the floor and is dead on the floor. So there has to be, there absolutely has to be a, a solution that caused to, because the solution is working out how it happened. So you have to sort of do much more prep. I'm afraid to say, like, if you want a genuinely good thing where... Uh, a genuinely good game where there are answers to be found, you have to be in possession of those answers. Um, and the way that they get to those answers are entirely up to them. You know, and they might they might run circles around you and they might out outsmart you, but at the end of the day, that's just the game. There are always going to be more brains against yours. Your so your advantage is that they are working from improvisation. You have the time to plan. You have the time to come up with the things that they might think of. Um, and this is why, once again, using those cliches of watching back loads and loads of detective stories and CSI and uh, whatever you want to, whatever you want to watch, um, that this is a detect Luther. Um, Watch those back, use those tropes, but also then use them against the players and allow them to fall into the same traps as uh, protagonists do in detective stories, you know? And also, don't be afraid to, like, have, like, you know, don't be afraid to hold back on the combat, but also feel free to drop in a combat. Sometimes it is nice just to, like, there's a chase scene, like, in a cop show, there's always, like, a chase scene. Like, just something like that that breaks up the investigation drama as well. You you want something that kind of 
ups the ante a little bit, like and breaks attention for a bit. Because if it's just build, 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 it's possible and it is very effective. But sometimes players want to just hit something every now and then to blow off steam. So it depends. If it's a one shot, then maybe not. But you know, if you're doing it like a campaign, like a a number of sessions, then feel free to throw lots of different things in. The vampire game that I'm running currently has a two mysteries running through it. Um, there is the problem with Ripper. There is an individual or something or some creature, whatever, in London called Ripper causing a scene. And there is also the other mystery, which is who sired the um, the player characters. They don't know who their sires were. And uh, it doesn't seem like anyone does. So that's also like a, a cool thing. Um, so, uh, and I know the answers to both of those questions. Um, so, Going back to Jeff's question, I think because I have the solution in my head, because I know what the answers are, it's really just down to you going to the right places and asking the right questions. And if you earn enough of that information, you will discover those things. Um, That's a great way of doing it, in my opinion. (laughs) I just said that's a great way of doing it, like as it's my game. I didn't mean it like that. It's just good. It, It works for me. That's what I meant. Uh, ba, 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 la, la, la. Oh, put my glasses on. I thought I'd take my glasses off because usually like, there's a glare on the screen, like when I put them on, but I can't be bothered now. Uh, so let's see. Jeff Doty says, Man, Robin, just Rob, just pop in off that Shakespeare like it's nothing. It's my job, it's been my job for a long time. Um, so I can do I can do more than the witches. Um, but I do like the witches. They're good fun. <laughs> T says, question, wouldn't you agree that track as an investigation skill is pretty much moot? I mean, if the orcs come and kidnap all our women and track the ranger and he fails, no adventure. Oh, so if they fail on... That's the thing, though, isn't it, T? Like, if you base... If you base the the future of the entire campaign on one role, that that on your head be it, you know, like that's entirely down to the DM. Uh, if that happens, I think it's hilarious if it happens. I think that like if they if they fail one role and then they're like, no, you don't know where they've gone. Um, but that, who's to say that there isn't a better tracker in the woods? Say you lose the tracks, they disappear, and you're like, well, hang on, there we go. T, you just helped me come up with a mystery scenario. We have a village. They've kidnapped women and children and people, uh, anyone, basically. The orcs have come along and they've grabbed anyone they can uh, who could work as slaves, okay? And they run off into the night. And the players show up and they start following the tracks. And yes, the ranger has succeeded in tracking. But then, as they get to the middle of this meadow, in this valley, the tracks disappear what happened to the orcs and what happened to the prisoners where are they gone <gasps> see the tracks then become the very thing the, the 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 mystery of the vanishing orc tracks you know like what what happened there um i would love i would love to play that game <laughs> <laughs> um caius says uh by the pricky of my thumbs rob galetta this way comes absolutely uh, Jeff Day says, "Question: Given the uh, given the that a solution is required for an investigation game, what do you do if the players are unable to find a solution? Do you guide them or let them fail? What if they never get it?" <laughs> um, I think that's the thing. Like, you've got to just make sure that you're like continually giving them information. Like, don't ever leave if if they're stumped. Give them something. Have a character show up. Have them get a phone call. Have them receive a raven. <laughs> you know, like just just keep drip feeding them, and eventually they will get there. I I seriously doubt that there are many people in this world that will come up with a D and D campaign that is so the the mystery is so difficult to get that like an ordinary player just wouldn't have a chance. Like I don't think that that's going to happen many times. I think. You know, if 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 their goal is you've got to make the goal clear, who killed this person? Then as soon as you find motive and a weapon and um are able to prove it in a number of ways, then there you go. It's kind of simple how to find out how who killed someone. It's just 
yeah, like the the core of it anyway, in terms of a gaming mechanic or, or a, a session mechanic rather. Um, just keep with that information. I think, man, I want to run some more mysteries now. Gaming Gotham says, question unrelated but necessary. Uh, I could not help but notice you said that you were a fan of the Bat. I am a wee bit of a fan myself. Favorite Robin and why? Oh, that is a good question. Yeah, I don't mind going off top of it to talk about Batman, man. I love Batman. Well, the thing is, obviously, you've got to love the original. Um, you know, Dick Grayson went on to become Nightwing. You know, and Nightwing is just rad. Um, I. Jason Todd is interesting because of the red hood. This is the thing. Like, I like, I like Dick Grayson, but more because he becomes Nightwing. I like uh, Jason Todd, but more because he becomes the Red Hood. I like Tim Drake because Tim Drake, in my opinion, is the best Robin. Um, I think as a character, he suits the role best and helps Batman the best as Robin. Um, and Damien. Uh, while I did not like Damien in the beginning, I came round to his character. And obviously, there's a lot more other Robins that you can talk about as well. You can talk about Carrie Kelly. And, ooh, Carrie Kelly's out there as well. I'm not going to count Carrie Kelly because uh, Dark Knight Returns, in my opinion, is a dark uh, timeline that didn't happen. Um, but there we go. <laughs> good good question, though, Gaming and Gotham. And glad to have you here, man. Mm. So... Uh, Jeff Davis says, assuming a one-shot or primary sole focus uh, of the game. Yeah. My methods and games are amazing, in my opinion, Rob, 2018. <laughs> I didn't mean that. I didn't mean it like that. I am humble. Goodness. Another question. Uh, is a uh, resolution necessary to get an investigation? Is there a problem with an open-ended investigation? I love Lovecraft stories that never end up explained. I think the thing is, um, I think Lovecraft, weirdly, is the best thing at doing this, is they follow this murder trail, uh, and it's all very, very human. It's all very, very real world. And then all of a sudden, they start discovering mysterious ruins. They start seeing carvings in people's bodies. They start seeing sacrifices, people talking strange languages, people seeing things that aren't really there. And all of a sudden, this real world doesn't seem to feel so real anymore. And there is a portal before them, and they are seeing shapes of things that are alive and speaking to their very souls. And then there is nothing. That is how you do a, um, a Lovecraft investigation game in the sense that it's more, rather than investigating a problem and working your way towards it, you have simply taken the plug out of a bath and you were spiraling towards that pipe, you know, like that. <laughs> That's essentially what it is. And I don't think there's any problem in there not being a resolution to games like that where it actually turns out, holy Christ, this actually goes into something much larger than we ever could have imagined and we can't imagine it because that's that's the nature of the old ones and i can't even begin to describe what they look like you know that 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 kind of deal um so i think if handled correctly then yeah yeah you can sort of leave it uh without resolution as long as there's something that maybe it isn't about the resolution of the mis the mystery of them maybe it's a resolution of like a character arc maybe you know someone someone wasn't able to save someone once before and they feel like their actions have actually helped save people so they are content knowing that while the mystery isn't solved they've still helped people like give them something but unless it's cthulhu in which case let them die horribly and alone um it can work in stories, uh, but in a game, still, does it work? I think it does, yeah. Uh, Grayson says, I'm always torn between Dick and Jason. Um, <laughs> just don't say that in public. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, they're both great. Like, uh, Don't get me wrong, like, I absolutely adore them. Uh, if, it was, if it was between uh, Dick Grayson and Jason, it would be Dick Grayson. Uh, I think Jason, Jason didn't get it. Just Jason never, ever fully got what it meant, which was his downfall. T. The Rye says, Damien is a bully. He reminds me uh, too much of uh, Amanda Waller, the buzzkiller of the DC Universe. He is a bully, but I think 
the interesting thing, the interesting stuff with Damien comes along when he becomes part of Team Titans and he has to is forced to work together with other people and other people his age. Um, and he's actually beginning to learn that the thing is with Damien, like he doesn't need to learn how to be a better fighter. He doesn't need to learn to be a better warrior because he's just been risen. He's risen through, uh, you know, the grace of Talia and Raz al Ghul. You know, he's been trained within an inch of his life. Uh, the thing that's interesting with Damien is when he's learning how to be more like a, a boy, like he's learning to be a 12 year old boy because he's been a, just a mass murderer like the whole time. And now he's actually with Batman's aid and with the Teen Titans aid, like he becomes human. Uh, I think that's the interesting stuff with Damien. But yeah, he's a bit of a dickhead as well. Uh, pardon, dick, dickhead, whatever. Uh, Kaya says, uh, how do you balance giving the right amount of clues? Too many and it's too easy, too few and they have no chance. Can you improv this balance or are old school text boxes better for this? I think you could probably improvise it. Like if they're like on the cusp of maybe getting something right, then say, yeah, okay, yeah, you, yeah, you think this might mean this. And yeah, I think with, yeah, definitely see how it goes. I think a lot of this will be down to as much as I'm saying like you need to prepare a lot, like at the same time, you have to also prepare to be flexible with the information that they're totally dealing with. Because if they if they get one, this is the thing, like if someone gets like a problem, if they have like a riddle or something, if someone gets fixated on one method of thought, they will completely ignore everything else and then they'll be lost forever. They'll be guessing for a hundred years and never, never get it. Um, and that can't be helped sometimes. So definitely be ready to, you know, sling them a few favors here and there. Kai says, I want to like Jeff's comments. So do I. Uh, b -b 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 uh, in fact, it's a shame, actually, that these these uh, comments, uh, this is something that I've thought of, and maybe YouTube, if you're watching, which you're not. Uh, but if you are, I would love to see the, an option to have, like, live chat comments. Because it'd just be nice. It'd just be nice for, the, for people to be able to read what people have been asking as well, like, after the... Uh, I know I've been reading them out, but still, you know, it'd be nice, a nice little feature. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, let's see. Okay, right. I have one or two more ones left on Facebook, and then I'm going to have to wrap this up. But I, will, I, I saw that there were a few more in the chat as well, so I'll read these quickly, and then I'll read the others. Nicholas Jacquet says, it'd be great to get your view on this. What do you think about PCs actively trying to kill another PC? Something like a scheme or a plot that he wants. Uh, I think that's fine. I have no qualms. If a if if a PC has a genuine reason why he wants to kill another PC, then it should happen. Why should why who are you to get in their way? You know, uh, everyone is equal in in, in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, there is a dungeon master, but it does not mean that he's a master of anyone around that table. This is not your game; it is everyone's game. And if they want to, um, if one of them feels that they want to try and take out the other, if it fits within the, the realms of the social contract and the story that you're playing, then yeah, it should happen. I've been in a game where there have been very, very aggressive PvP fights that have been to the death and have been for very, very genuine reasons. Um, one of the, like an early campaign that I ran with my friends in university when I was running games in university, the final encounter was a PvP. Um, because one was trying to save a city um, and the other was trying to destroy a city, the same city. Um, and it involved, the whole campaign involved like this city who, that floats above this chasm essentially as a defense, defensive precaution. Uh, all of its glyphs and warding spells have been worn away and taken apart um, by an entity known as Star Thief. I've talked about Star Thief before, um, but essentially um, the player character who was the monk had a crisis of faith and led to aligning himself with Star Thief, who was trying to become an ascendant god. And the way he was going to become an ascendant god was by having so many people sacrificed in his name and so many people bear witness to the um, actions of Star Thief that he himself would ascend to godhood. And the other player, because this is just a two-player campaign as well, which made it even more intense, uh, the other player uh, discovered this, Theodrex the Hemlon, and fought Sayrak the monk atop the fortress to prevent the whole place from collapsing into the abyss. And it is one of my favourite uh, ever encounters that I've ever run for D&D. &D. So don't, don't rob yourselves of opportunities like that. 
Um, and then he says, how would you explain magic, especially clerics, paladins, in a setting where gods aren't real? People can't, can believe, but they're not real, like in the D- current D&D law. Yeah, um, well, that's always been the thing, isn't it? Like, uh, surely if the powers are there, then they would have to be there. So how do you explain it? Um, I'd be, I, I'm really vague about it, to be honest, man. Like, uh, with the law keepers, I'm still sort of making tweaks to the pantheon and to the religion of the world um because i want to make sure that it's relatively in keeping with what's already come before there is a religion of the god king uh which is a presence on the uh he's a god king like his presence is on the material plane uh to to what people understand anyway um so that's where a lot of the power comes from in terms of that like there's a real person out there that is giving them power my goodness me and then there are the old gods there are the gods that remain silent and don't answer and don't provide power or maybe they do maybe they provide power to certain people people that need it in times of darkness um that's uh the way that i handle it man like i mean i i, I try and be vague about it um and if you know, I mean, if there's a forces of the arcane and you're like, well, where do they come from? That comes from like an alternate dimension where magic is created. It's like, oh, okay. You know, so why would you be, at, oh, okay, when there's like a divine magic being used at the same time, you know? Uh, Connor Davis says, uh, what are some unconventional campaign session ones? On that note, do you like having all four PCs start at the same place and introduce them one by one to the scenario? Um, I like having PCs start uh, either in different places or in the in the same place like it's easier in the same place what I always insist on is that players don't unless for a very good reason players don't know each other and I've spoken about this before so I won't go into it too much but I think once again like if you are uh, not allowing your characters to introduce themselves to other people in role-playing encounters you are you're robbing the game of something because the introduction of a character is relevant whether the characters in the table know them or not because it's an exercise for the player to be doing they are working out who they are and who they are acting who they are what they are like when they're acting around people for the first part of the time and they don't know each other that's a really important thing it's a really important thing for the player playing that character to go through as well as telling the other people around the table who this character is um, because these characters might have been hanging around for a long time, but these players haven't. This is the first session, remember? So, you know, why waste that opportunity? So that would be my answer to that. Unconventional campaign session ones. You know what, Connor? I am going to make a note of that, and I'm going to make that a entire stream, because I really like that idea. Um, so I will watch this back and remember, <laughs> hopefully. But that's a really good one. I will definitely get to that question because I would like to do a whole thing on that. Um, And then O'Neill Flynn says, PCs who live long enough to be a villain. Sure, it's been talked about before. It has a a lot of times, I'm afraid, O'Neill. We will will get around to it at some point, though, I'm sure, once again. Um, Well, I I just talk a lot about villains, to be honest, man. Like, I can't help it. Uh, Okay, so then finally, there was one more question here, I think. I swear there was one more question. Um, okay, one last one from Jeff Doe. Question, is it possible and or in good form to have PCs in the know or even responsible for the villainy in an investigation? Too cheesy, too antagonistic. How would it tie in a PC this way? Um, so I think it's actually a good thing to have in investigation games for um, if you wanted to go that direction. It's cool to have players have different motivations and different goals. Maybe it's one person's goal to find out who the murderer is. Perhaps it's the other person's goal to ensure that that player doesn't find out who the murderer is. You know, maybe that's the answer we're looking for. Maybe there isn't just one set way out of this game. Maybe it is the victory of another person to ensure that the other person doesn't get the right answer. You know? Um, I've been in games like that. I was uh, my only LARPing experience was like that. It was a murder mystery kind of. Uh, oh, what was it based on? What was this system? I don't know. I'm not hugely into LARP, and it wasn't like a fantasy one. It was like a. I was like a semi a semiotic assassin from the future. I remember that. That was really weird. Um, but yeah, I think it's good to 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 include villainy and even have some people responsible for it. That would be hilarious. In fact, if one of the players after all this time was actually the murderer. Mm. very very interesting and then you get a pvp at the end 
Um, I think that'll do us, won't it? Yeah, I think that'll do us. So heading back over to the Hangouts. So thank you ever so much for those of you who watched. Um, next time when I do this, Lloyd will be back, I'm sure, and we'll be back on the Dias cast as usual. Um, in the meantime, if you do have any other thoughts or streams or questions that you would like to, um, you know, hear me or Lloyd talk about, then hit one of us up, post into either a uh, performance check on Facebook or just the absolute tabletop community or post in the in fact best place to do it where I will definitely see if you want to talk to, to, to me to talk about something, post it in the comments below once this video is uploaded to YouTube um, and I'll be able to, you know, make some more videos for you, I guess. Uh, but this has been really fun. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I hope that's been helpful. I hope that hasn't been too rambly. Uh, all that remains for me to say is uh, thank you very much for watching, and I hope that all of your performances are standard.